A device imitating the spider's spinning gland was created. Japanese scientists have developed a device that produces artificial spinning thread. They claim that the thread created in the laboratory is very similar to what spiders produce naturally. The artificial silk gland can recreate the complex molecular structure of the thread produced by spiders by imitating the various chemical and physical changes that occur in their silk gland. The artificial spider gland was developed in research led by K.G. Numata of the RIKEN Center for Sustainable Resource Science in Japan. Scientists from the RIKEN Pioneering Research Cluster also participated in the research. The device was designed to reflect the physical and chemical changes that occur in the spider's gland. The description and results of the work were published in the journal, Nature Communications. Spider thread has very good mechanical properties. It is flexible and can stretch up to 40%. Without prejudice. It also has the highest strength among natural fibers, which is comparable to steel of the same diameter. The thread produced by spiders is also biocompatible which means it may have medical applications. It is also biodegradable. So why is it so rarely used? Because breeding spiders to produce thread on a large scale is difficult. First of all, spiders tend to eat each other, so maintaining the farm itself is problematic. Additionally, in breeding they produce a small amount of valuable spinning thread. Researchers have been trying for years to develop a fiber with similar properties to spinning thread. So far, nothing has been created that could be used in mass production. However, it is worth mentioning research from a few months ago, in which Chinese scientists modified silkworms so that they produce spider webs instead of silk. Genetically modified bacteria were also used to produce spinning thread. Spindle thread is a biopolymer fiber made of large proteins with highly repetitive sequences, called spadroins. The spinning thread also contains other molecular structures called beta sheets, which must be properly arranged so that the thread fibers can maintain their unique mechanical properties. Recreating this complex molecular architecture is not a simple task. Scientists from RIKEN adopted a biomimetic approach in their work. In this study, we tried to mimic natural silk thread production using microfluidics, which involves flowing and manipulating small amounts of fluids through narrow channels. Indeed, one could say that the spider's spiny gland functions as a kind of natural microfluidic device, Numata said. The device developed is a small, rectangular box with tiny channels cut into it. The spadroin precursor solution is placed at one end and then directed to the other end using a vacuum. As the solution flows through the microfluidic channels, it is exposed to precisely selected changes in chemical and physical conditions, which are possible thanks to the special design of the microfluidic system. Under appropriate conditions, spadroin proteins self-assemble into thread fibers with a characteristic complex structure. Choosing the right parameters to identify the correct conditions was not easy. But ultimately, it was possible to optimize the interactions between different areas of the microfluidic system. During experiments, researchers discovered, among other things, that using force to push the protein precursor did not work. Only when vacuum was used to move the spadroin solution, fibers with the correct structure were formed. It was surprising how robust the microfluidic system was once various conditions were established and optimized. The fiber laying was spontaneous, extremely fast and highly repeatable. Importantly, 
The fibers showed a clear hierarchical structure that can be found in the fiber of a natural spinning thread, admitted Ali Malay, one of the co-authors of the publication. Ideally, we would like to have an impact on the real world. For this to happen, we will need to scale up our fiber production and make it a continuous process. We will also assess the quality of our artificial spinning thread using several indicators and based on this we will make further improvements, new matter emphasized. Ancient, chewing gum, sheds light on the Stone Age diet. 30 years ago in Sweden at an archaeological site dating back approximately 10,000 years. Years ago, scientists found pieces of birch bark resin on which human teeth were clearly imprinted. Studies of DNA extracted from this ancient, chewing gum, have revealed the diet of people at that time. Deer, trout and nuts dominated but researchers also found signs of gum disease. Birch tar, or birch tar or birch slime, is a sticky black substance that has been used for thousands of years for its adhesive, hydrophobic and even antibacterial properties. It is the oldest synthetic substance ever discovered, and its earliest uses are attributed to Neanderthals. Produced by heating birch bark, Tar was used by our ancestors primarily as a natural brew. Hunters used it to attach arrowheads, and it helped early craftsmen construct tools. But birch tar also had other uses. Tar lumps found in archaeological sites often contain traces of teeth. And given the antiseptic properties of birch resin, it may also have served as a prehistoric treatment for periodontal disease. Although this may also be an overinterpretation, because birch tar solidifies over time and could be chewed to make it more flexible and suitable for use as glue. In the 1990s, three pieces of chewed birch tar with clear tooth impressions were found at the Hoosaby Clev site north of Gothenburg. Thousands of flint artifacts and human bones were found at this site. Based on the age of the sediments in which the ancient, chewing gums, were found, scientists estimated that they were between 9,540 and 9,890 years old. Scientists managed to extract human DNA from birch tar. On this basis, the genetic profile of people who chewed it was mapped. Thanks to this, Scientists determined that birch tar was chewed by teenagers. We found some samples and both men and women were chewing them. Most of them looked like they were chewed by teenagers. Said Anders Gotherstrom, co-author of the publication published in the journal, Scientific Reports. Chewed birch tar from the Stone Age is a relatively common find. It is known that various substances with similar properties, such as coniferous tree resins, have been used in similar ways in other parts of the world. On the fossilized tar, researchers also found DNA from other organisms, such as fungi and bacteria, that had been living in the chewed goo since it was thrown out. But some of the bacteria came from people who chewed tar. These are the bacteria you would expect to find in your oral microbiome. Scientists also found traces of bacteria that cause certain diseases, such as tooth decay. They also found bacterial traces of systemic diseases and bacteria that cause abscesses. However, most of the bacteria belong to the microorganisms causing periodontitis. In one piece, which was probably chewed by a teenage girl, scientists found an array of bacteria indicating a severe case of gum infection. This teenager probably started losing her teeth shortly after chewing this gum. It must have hurt, admitted Gotherstrom. 
Scientists also found DNA from other, larger organisms on chewed artifacts. It probably came, as researchers suggest, from plants and animals that had previously been eaten by teenagers chewing birch tar. Scientists have discovered DNA from brown trout, red deer and hazelnuts. They also found traces of apples, ducks, a European robin, several canids, a wolf and a fox. Researchers indicate that Stone Age Scandinavians could, in addition to eating these species, use their teeth to process the bones of these creatures into tools. They may also have used the teeth to prepare the skins of these animals. Other plants, apart from the detected hazelnuts, included mistletoe. According to researchers, it could have been used for medicinal purposes or to produce poison for arrowheads. The discoveries represent a major step towards understanding Stone Age culture. As the analysis continues, more surprises may emerge. The most accurate moon landing in history. Slim landed just 55 meters from the target. A few weeks ago, the Japanese Slim Lander landed on the lunar surface. Due to problems with positioning the solar cells and, consequently, power supply problems, the lander was turned off. One of the goals of the mission was to demonstrate precision landing technology at a distance of up to 100 meters from the designated target. And it worked. Analysis of data obtained before the power outage confirmed that Slim landed approximately 55 meters east of its destination. Thanks to the Slim, smart lander for investigating Moon, Pro. Japan became the fifth country in the world to successfully place a probe on the lunar surface. It was the first such precise landing in history. Japanese scientists managed to place the probe 55 meters from the previously designated target, and not as was the case with previous attempts, which ended several to several dozen kilometers from the designated place. The landing maneuver began on January 19, and although it was a great success, it did not go according to plan. SLIM has settled on the surface in such a way that no light hits its solar panels, preventing the equipment from being powered. Therefore, SLIM has been disabled. This does not mean the final end of the mission. If some sunlight reaches the solar cells, there is a chance that SLIM will come back to life. Analysis of the data shows that SLIM's solar cells are currently facing west, suggesting that there is the potential to generate power, and thus wake up slim, as lighting conditions improve. JAXA admitted that all technical data regarding the landing maneuver and navigation camera data recorded during descent and on the lunar surface. Necessary for the development of precision landing technology, were transmitted to Earth. The spectroscopic camera on board SLIM also operated and recorded images until the power was turned off. The unlucky positioning of the lander on the lunar surface, preventing it from generating energy, is due to engine problems, JAXA emphasized in a statement. The obtained technical data showed that at an altitude of 50 meters, just before the start of the obstacle avoidance maneuver, the thrust force decreased. Engineers indicate that one of the two main engines was most likely lost. If this turns out to be true, the landing will be an even greater feat. If not for this, the landing could have been even more precise. In such circumstances, the SLIM onboard software independently identifies the anomaly and controls the ship's orientation as much as possible. SLIM continued its descent on only one engine. The falling speed at the moment of contact with the lunar surface was approximately 1.4 meters per second. 
The cause of the loss of functionality of the main engine is currently being investigated. Slim transported two spherical mini probes in its bowels. They are about the size of a tennis ball and can change shape, making it easier for them to move around the surface of the silver globe. The two small rovers were intended to help the mission team monitor the health of the larger lander, take photos of the landing site and provide an independent system for direct communication with Earth. Perhaps if Slim wakes up, I will be able to pursue these tasks. But under the circumstances, they successfully conducted operations on the lunar surface, as JXAX put it. The small probes LEV-1 and LEV-2, short for Lunar Excursion Vehicle, were released from inside the lander before landing. According to JAXA, LEV-1 provided communications with ground stations as well as LEV-2 and SLIM. Currently, LEV-1 has completed its planned operational period, which means its batteries have exhausted. The ability to resume operations depends on the generation of solar energy as a result of the change in the direction of the sun. Efforts will be continued to continue receiving signals from LEV-1, the statement reads.